to the European Alliance for Apprenticeships uh, webinar. I'm Ana Carrero. I work in the unit in DG Employment in the Commission uh, in charge of vocational education and training and apprenticeships. And today we will talk about apprenticeships in the construction sector and how they can drive the green transition in the EU through the renovation wave. For but before we start talking about the topic, for those that are new to these webinars, just a quick word on the European Alliance for Apprenticeships, what we called EAFA. It is a network for policymakers, companies, social partners and other stakeholders uh, who work together to have more and better apprenticeship programs while improving uh, the image of apprenticeships. The Alliance is also a hub for knowledge sharing and a source of contacts to develop common projects. So this webinar is part of the activities planned under the Alliance Action Plan for 2023 and we encourage you to stay tuned for other future activities and also to join the Alliance as a member if these topics uh, <clears throat> appeal to you. So in today's event, we will draw attention to the construction sector in particular, a sector that plays a crucial role in the EU, both economically and environmentally, because approximately 6% of the EU GDP uh, comes from the construction sector, and it directly employs 13 uh, million workers and about 27 indirectly. So initiatives such as the Renovation Wave and the new European Bauhaus, which are part of the EU Green Deal, seek to transform the sector to focus more on energy efficiency, uh, carbon reduction and the adoption of eco-friendly uh, materials. And of course, uh, such a transition will require upskilling and reskilling of the workers. So. In the webinar, we will explore how apprenticeships can support the construction sector in the EU in addressing the, the challenges and opportunities um, presented by this uh, green transition. And to talk about this today, we have a varied panel uh, with representatives of social partners, EU agencies, European associations and, and vet schools. So uh, thanks a lot already for being here uh, with us today. And for our participants, just to flag that you can leave comments and ask questions in the chat and we will do our best to raise them uh, in, in the different occasions that we will have for Q&A uh, during the session. And now, without further ado, I hand over the floor to Estelina. Um, Chatsit Christo, a policy and research expert uh, at CEDEFOP, who will introduce the session with uh, the broader picture. Stelina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, good morning from me as well. Thank you very much for inviting CEDEFOP to this webinar. Um, the uh, work of uh, CEDEFOP on apprenticeships uh, is uh, long standing, and uh, of course, now it couples with our analysis and research on the impact of the green transition on skills and jobs. Before I start my presentation, I know that the organizers have um, a small, short uh, question uh, for you to, to see the, uh, the assessment of the participants uh, about developments uh, regarding employment in construction. So uh, if you can please launch the, the question, uh, there should be a pop up. Yes, here it is. So um, from your experience and your understanding, um, what do, how many do you think will be the workers that will re be required to match the demands in the sector by 2035? Well, I see that there are very different views, uh, which uh, will make my presentation more relevant, maybe. <laughs> um, OK, we have almost, let's reach uh, 30 responses if possible. So two more, 31, so we have exceeded. So we see that uh, almost half uh, believe that it will be 7 million, uh, about 40%, 12 million, and 13% um, are less optimistic. They expect 3 million. Um, this is a forecast number, so we cannot say what is correct or not, but I can uh, deliver the, the, the number uh, as identified by the projections of set of skills forecast in my presentation. Uh, I keep notice, however, of the fact that there are people that are much more uh, optimistic and some that have concerns about developments in the sector. 
Uh, so I start with sharing my um, presentation. Just to confirm that you can see it. Um, my presentation today will highlight some key findings from SETEFOP's work on skills intelligence. And what we mean by skills intelligence is the fact that we try to combine meaningfully blend quantitative data and qualitative information in order to identify policy messages. And why this is necessary? Because the complexity of uh, today's environment, let alone of the green transition specifically, is such that no one uh, data source can provide the uh, information, the understanding necessary for policymakers, decision makers to understand how they can go about. So we use our skills forecast, which gives projection on employment and skills, uh, the, the most recent one up to 2035. We have run sectoral skills foresights in, in sectors, particularly on the green transition. And of course, we beef up our analysis and understanding from qualitative research and analysis and networks and groups of experts. Um, very much uh, important is our uh, more recent uh, line of work on uh, understanding what employers actually need and ask for uh, as they uh, share them in online job uh, advertisements. All our information regarding the, uh, the green uh, transition uh, is available on our green observatory. But just start with some key insights, overall insights about the labor market trends. Um, Definitely one of the key insights from our forecast is that the demands will regard a more highly skilled um, uh, persons. Uh, this means uh, people with uh, higher levels of qualifications. For example, job openings up to 2035, uh, for every uh, 100 job openings, 57 are expected for people with higher qualifications. This does not mean that there's not going to be employment uh, growth and opportunities for people with medium and even low uh, level of qualifications, but it does signal um, uh, steps necessary for policy making. But at the same time, there is room and important, um, importance of taking action regarding providing people with training that is considered more basic, for example, regarding digital skills, which are a transversal skill, if I may say now, across uh, sectors and occupations. Our second European Skills and Jobs Survey highlighted that there is already at 20 to uh, almost 40 percent of people that identify their need to learn more about what are considered digital skills. Definitely, there are people that that are trainable in more complicated, more advanced skills, which doesn't mean that the same share of people actually use them in their uh, in their work. But what is important here, and especially I would say for uh, the construction sector that has a significant share of low skilled um, uh, workers, is that there is room and need for training people on basic digital skills. When going to the green transition, um, it's important for us to understand, first of all, the type of occupations that we see as critical. What you see here is the analysis from our uh, sectoral skills foresights on four sectors. Um, uh, construction was not in because there is, of course, the blueprint construction that does excellent work on, on this area. But uh, from our overall analysis, we see how relevant these groups are across sectors. It is important to stress that we will not need only people with technical job specific skills. Frontline uh, jobs, frontline green uh, jobs are necessary, definitely, uh, for exa example, construction professionals, as are green tech specialists, because the green transition is stimulated by innovation. But at the same time, we see an increased importance of uh, managerial positions, which are the people that can address uh, issues of uh, our uh, planning, of arrangement, of ensuring that some business models may need to change even, um, and also what we call uh, green uh, minds and hearts, which are the people that should inspire workers, make them understand why it's important, they can provide them training, and even so to the wider public, like why do we need to invest more, why do we need to have different uh, techniques, different building aspects in our homes, in our infrastructure. And for sure, digital specialists have been identified across sectors, which again strengthens the argument that it is did indeed a twin transition. I would like to focus a bit uh, your attention on some occupations that uh, may be very small in employment shares and sometimes in policy making justifiably the focus falls on uh, occupations that are very uh, large in employment shares. 
However, there are occupations that may be small in this regard, but without them we cannot make the transition happen. Exactly because the green transition does rest upon innovation and um, that and technologies, it is important to see these occupations that can design um, uh, concepts, do the concept note about how to develop specific aspects of technology, but also to implement it. So these occupations that are mostly uh, in research and development and engineering profiles, but also at technician level, because they are the ones that implement uh, the technologies are very important. And instead of we have coined the term of thyroid occupations because they are small but indispensable or niche occupations, if you want to call them, we will soon publish our first analysis on some of these occupations. But which are these famous uh, skills for the green transition? Um, I think everyone doing research in the field has had this question before. There is definitely not one uh, comprehensive uh, definite list of these uh, skills that are uh, relevant for all occupations across sectors. But what is important to understand is that our research highlighted there it's a range of occupations um, from very technical job specific uh, regarding production, for example, to digital and data analysis skills, but also strategic skills in order how to understand how to build to design our products, our services, etc. in within the green transition and the digital transition. Marketing and communication skills again corroborate the importance of the some of the occupations highlighted earlier because it is a change and workers and consumers and clients for co construction need to understand why we need to make the change. An important element that came across our, um, our analysis during the foresight was about systems thinking and empathy, which are a set of skills not very common uh, in the analysis. By systems thinking, we mean the importance of people understanding that there are different drivers and different factors that need to be taken into consideration. And that has a significant role to play here because such um, uh, such new mindsets, such skills, uh, synthetic skills can be strengthened through, let's say, gamification, through uh, work based learning, etc. And empathy uh, is definitely a, a soft skill, not very common one, but it has it draws the attention of the need to have a more people centered approach when we are discussing about designing new products and new services. It is not only about short term profit or certain benefits of any sort. It is important also to look at the wider picture and what are the what is the impact of our uh, new uh, uh, actions and our products uh, on, on people in the local community or even wider. Specifically on uh, construction sector, it is a sector as um, people involved in it know uh, that is quite uh, sensitive to changes uh, in uh, the uh, economic cycles and of course to very uh, big uh, changes in um, uh, geopolitical uh, aspects, for example, as the war in Ukraine. But what we see for the future, um, uh, and here is the, let's say, right number <laughs> from the question, is that there is a, a, a small uh, decrease foreseen, about 1% uh, for the period 2021 to 2035. However, the replacement demand, which is defined as the, uh, the number of people that will choose to leave their jobs in construction, because mostly retirement, but for other reasons too, will the de uh, develop will will make room for substantial job demand of uh, um, de definitely seven million job openings. The, we, as you can understand, this comes from a, a foresight uh, model, uh, and econometricians can argue about the assumptions. But it is important to see that there is potential. And when we move to the uh, expected employment shares of, of the key occupations in, in, in construction, of course, uh, the workers are the ones that keep the lion's share. But if you notice, we can see that it is other type of occupation that increase in importance. For example, construction engineering technicians, even business administration roles, which link to the uh, uh, slide and the uh, my points about the thyroid occupations and about possibly the uh, fortification of jobs that require higher uh, qualifications. Now, the construction sector definitely uh, has uh, faces challenges because of its uh, nature, of its structure, of the size of um, 
of, um, of companies and, and digitalization, which is a very important part and integral part, if I may say, of uh, the, the sector's innovation, where we see there is more needs for uh, taking uh, for taking up. Besides the digitalization and definitely the green transition that we are uh, discussing here, and of course, many of its elements are already addressed in the renovation wave. Um, some of the challenges and if I may say relevant opportunities to see it, to see it in, a, in a more positive way is the importance of having um, a management in the sector that can now tackle the different way of working, uh, which is a more, um, uh, let's say, attention to teamwork, more uh, complex teams uh, at the same time managing people that need upskilling and reskilling. And again, the soft skills uh, gain attention uh, from the analysis because it has to be, let's say, a shift. Uh, there has to be a shift from focusing only on very uh, important uh, job specific skills, but also to soft skills exactly to also address the way that the people have to um, collaborate from now on on more teamwork, on having more adaptability, etc. Absolutely, one of the challenges is also the supply chain disruptions and the increased cost of energy. We unfortunately saw examples of that, of this vulnerability, if I may say, of the sector very recently because of the war. And the, the sector seems to uh, be facing uh, significant skill mismatching uh, challenges, as highlighted by uh, CEDEFOP's uh, second European Skills and Jobs Survey. Um, the responses regard the responses of workers uh, in the sector. And we see here um, very important, in my view, policy messages um, that already 15% of workers uh, identify themselves as having significant skill gaps and 10% about digital skills gaps. They ask for training. Half of them say that they need technical skills training and a bit over 40% that they need social skills training. So again, it's underlining the importance of having upskilling and reskilling uh, opportunities for both, let's say, big groups of type of skills. And at the same time, the mismatch uh, elements is um, uh, highlighted in the fact that there is almost one third of workers that said that they feel overqualified in their work, which means that their skills are, let's say, uh, higher or more uh, specific than the actual tasks they are asked to do. Uh, uh, whilst we see that the share of the low skilled workers remains relatively high, which is one of the uh, features of the uh, construction sector. And here, if I may say, is um, an important note to take because definitely um, upskilling and reskilling are important. The, the role of VET is important, as I will stress later. But at the same time, there are skill shortages across our economy that are more relevant to job quality. It is important to ensure that people not only have jobs, but these jobs have been designed in a way that make the best use of the workers so they don't feel overqualified or underqualified. And they have, for example, opportunities for training opportunities for development uh, of course uh, the the fact of safety is extremely important in some of the jobs uh, of in construction but it's also important to to keep in mind that some of the shortages may have to do with the attractiveness of the sector uh, that's also relevant to the quality aspects of jobs now, how to drive more innovation and understand the innovation um, for, let's say, drive of the sector, uh, we used an analysis from what we call technology intensive occupations, which are calculated based on our skills um, uh, forecast database. So, although there is definitely a cross research uh, agreed the, the need for the sector to take up more uh, technology and that the, the sector's productivity uh, is definitely an area for improvement, uh, there is modest take up, especially among SMEs and just um, comparing with manufacturing, uh, another important and very large sector, construction lags uh, a bit behind. So there is definitely room for improvement in occupations that are more, uh, uh, let's say, keen, more linked to uh, technology uh, use and advancement. The landscape of the uh, of the countries differs, of course, for various reasons. We see that there are countries that are, are doing quite a good job, but there's definitely opportunity in some other countries in increasing the share of these occupations. Uh, uh, 
to finalize quickly, uh, we see that they, uh, from our online job advertisements, uh, as all data, it has its limitations, but it does give the signal about the type of skills required in construction, which is, which are quite transversal and important uh, from working in teams <clears throat> While the need for, of course, for planning and scheduling and developing solutions remains high, they're higher than some, let's say, technical uh, skills. The adaptability and the work uh, and the, the ability to work independently may be skills that are not readily available in uh, people already employed in the sector. And it's definitely a message for initial vocational education that will um, uh, train young people to enter the sector. So. The role of it is, I would say, undeniably important, and there are two gears to take into consideration. The one is about, uh, let's say, uh, putting out the fire now, whatever the shortages, whatever the challenges are now. Uh, so relatively quickly, uh, quick actions, uh, which means that VET needs to, ride, uh, to run a sprint. But at the same time, VET also needs to be prepared for a marathon for the longer term, because the green transition specifically, it's not just some, uh, let's say, objectives to meet and then we are done. No, it's it's a change of paradigm, it's a change of mindsets, and along with the new technologies that will be coming along and the changes in consumer behavior, etc., VET needs to establish uh, a way to address these needs. And how to do that, besides the recalibration that was uh, highlighted earlier, uh, continuous uh, 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 vets um, needs to adjust to learners' needs. This is particularly important for low-skilled workers uh, for, that can benefit more, let's say, from short training modules, but also from um, elements like macro-credentials that can uh, facilitate the, their upgrading of their qualifications. And apprenticeships absolutely have a key role to play, um, not only for young people, but also for um, adults. It is important for me here to stress the, the need for more green skills anticipation, which means that stakeholders uh, from uh, government and, and national authorities, but also uh, employers and employees and other stakeholders need to form uh, uh, alliances, need to form networks um, th that will allow for the collection of, uh, of needs. And in order to understand better what are the skill needs now, what are the skill needs for the future, which can then uh, sequentially inform vets and allow for our uh, vet programs and systems to become more resilient and effective. We run a, a, a short virtual get together. We call them exactly on how green uh, vet can be greened and how uh, what are the challenges and what are the opportunities uh, in uh, in January 25th. Uh, so I welcome anyone to register. Thank you very much. Thank you, Estelina. Uh, very interesting and clear presentation. As as always, I noted down the the right figure: seven millions of uh, of workers. Uh, many of them uh, stemming from replacing uh, replacement needs. Uh, uh, skills mismatches, uh, shifts in the types of jobs, so many uh, many interesting insights. Job quality also as a source of uh, labor shortages. Uh, this is something that we have also uh, underlined in in the in our flagship report, the DSD report uh, that this year was focusing also on on labor shortages. So uh, we we acknowledge skills is not the solution to to every every challenge um, in a sector, but definitely I mean this uh, the need for new technologies and innovation, uh, young people or adults coming from apprenticeship programs uh, they can indeed play a an, an important role also as a driver of uh, of of change in in this context. So, um, having said that, uh, let's see, uh, well, some people are asking for the presentation. Of course, uh, we will be able uh, to cater uh, for that. But now I think it's it's time, if there are no uh, further questions on this presentation, uh, to introduce our panelists uh, uh, that will share with with us uh, some inspiring uh, practices. Um, so now I encourage you to uh, turn on your camera so everybody can see you. 
and I, I will introduce you before starting with the, with the first presentation. So we have uh, Rolf Gerin, political secretary of uh, the European Federation of Building and Wood Workers, that will be sharing with us how EU policies are, are having an impact on construction, both in terms of vision and in uh, practical aspects to, to deal with. Then we have Carmen de Vesa, the director of innovation of AEICE, an efficient construction in, in Valladolid, which is a non-profit organize, uh, organization. And she will share with us uh, the project they are leading, Habitable, uh, which implements sustainability and eco-friendly practices in vocational training for construction. Then we have Angela Martina, a vocational education and training chair at the European Construction Industry Federation. And Angela will explain how the industry is using apprenticeships to tackle labor shortages and to accelerate the green transition in the construction sector. And finally, we have Marcel de Gave, a civil engineer and project manager at the Institute of Training in the construction sector in Luxembourg. And he will explain how their training offer can facilitate the green transition in the construction sector. So welcome. Thanks a lot for your availability and for being here today with us to share uh, your surely inspiring um, experiences. And now we will start with uh, Rolf. So please, Rolf, go ahead and, and tell us a little bit more about uh, your uh, insights. Um, yes, uh, thank you for having the floor and uh, good morning to all of you. We are now more than 80 people. That's a big audience, a big interest in the, the question uh, about uh, training in the construction sector and how we manage uh, digital, digital transformation, but especially uh, the, the green transformation with focus on the renovation wave. And if you can move to the next slide. Um, that's uh, very kind and a bit more because it is uh, in if you click so it's not complete the slide something sneaks in um, when when we talk about the renovation wave we talk uh, uh, about uh, a number of involved uh, subsystems societal subsystems and that is a bit a reference to the modern uh, theory of systems uh, which which say that uh, the overall tendency in our societies is uh, higher differentiation. So the knowledge is growing and that produce more specific knowledge. We have seen a wonderful slide in Christy Schatzow's uh, presentation about skills, skills needs. And there were different uh, chapters and one was uh, the frontline jobs. And that was alone eight professions. We have to keep in mind that uh, a construction company often uh, counts five or seven people, but that was only the front line with eight, with eight professions. So we have differentiation of knowledge, but in the practical world, we have to uh, reduce complexity and differentiation. So that is on company level, but on political level, when talking about the renovation wave, it is extremely difficult to say what is a, a, a consistent policy in this area. So I have listed here a number of uh, involved subsystems. It is not ju just only construction. We will talk about the training system and education, that's clear, but we also need to talk about material and uh, the shortage of material. So the, what we have de de decided on European level with goodwill uh, that in uh, 2025, we have only a building stock with nearly or zero energy buildings. Is that realistic when we talk about material? We have the labor market. And there is one point I'd, I'd like to make to uh, Christy Schatzi's presentation. Uh, when talking about challenges, we have to talk about the labor market as well. We have uh, a tendency of self-employment and BOGO self-employment with effects which are not very uh, yeah, comfortable or not very welcome. Uh, self-employed people are normally out from health and safety services. Self-employed people are normally out from training and it is more difficult. So we have to, that is a challenge from my point uh, of view as well. 
And then we have uh, also working conditions. So the, the renovation wave needs to be carried out under good working conditions and healthy working conditions. We have just seen that uh, the EU has uh, passed a new asbestos uh, directive, protection of workers against exposure to asbestos. When we talk about the renovation wave, we talk about uh, renovation of or dis, uh, dismantling of asbestos because it is a building stock and the building stock with all the buildings built and, and yeah, constructed until 95, in some countries until 2025, 20, uh, you will find asbestos in, I don't know, maybe 80% of the building stock. If we take it serious, then the renovation wave will be much more expensive than estimated when we did our figures. So this this slide is just to, to show you that we live in a complex world which interact. And if we do not consider the various societal systems or political fields and areas involved, then we will never be able to formulate a consistent policy. And, and then it remains good promises without uh, little expectation that it becomes reality. So, but that is uh, a bit for for the, and, and one example you, you will all see and understand, we have now the campaign of, uh, you are EU from the European Commission, a wonderful campaign to promote the EU, uh, to, to prepare the elections next year and to show what the EU can do. But we have to be careful that we do not just use all the buzzwords promising the, the good and, and the, the blended future and so on. Uh, we have to connect our campaigns with the reality. There is one poster showing a worker, a construction worker on a roof, uh, doing some electrical uh, work on, on solar panels or, or photovoltaic panels. And uh, he is uh, working under uh, sunshine, big sunshine, without protection. He is barefoot. It is a, is a work area which is not secured. He has no protective equipment, not at all. And that from the EU, uh, whereas the EU was so effective and so active in the field of occupational safety and health. The campaign makers uh, have, have not provided a consistent uh, police policy. And this poster will be seen by tens of millions of workers in the EU. And they immediately see there is something wrong in this poster. So that is the EU bubble. They talk about things they don't know the reality. So we have to be careful. We have to, to to be careful when, yeah, when when um, defining our policies and this uh, complexity is one point. Next slide is uh, showing the complexity uh, more specific to our field. So when talking about the renovation wave and what we can do on European level towards the national level, and we talk, when we talk about the different levels, we have to be careful again. Uh, our experience is uh, honestly that, that we have a slight tendency to overcharge ourselves. We, we have a pact uh, for skills in the construction sector, which is good uh, and we promote it and we like it having this pact for skills. But uh, we have seen uh, since we have signed it for one and a half years uh, that it is extremely difficult to formulate on the European level what are the needs on company level. So when talking about our, our initiatives and our support for the renovation wave, then we have to, that's already a conclusion, we need to bring together the people from the different levels, otherwise, uh, otherwise you fail. And uh, on the European level, uh, there is also a differentiation, I call it vertical differentiation here on the European level. We have labor mar market uh, uh, aspects to consider, uh, vocational training system. Uh, that is an experience from one of our, or from both projects we did uh, the last years. We had one called vet for leg that was uh, vocational education and training for low energy construction. 
And uh, one of the results, we have known that before in brackets, is that the, the various systems of vocational education and training are so diverse that you can't uh, hardly formulate any uh, concept that fits for all. So you, you have to go to the country level and to see what of this uh, package of content and how I can implement it. That is uh, uh, a general difficulty. So le the legal framing is also uh, relatively uh, diverse from one to another country. Um, and then we have the EU programs. The EU programs are absolutely useful. So uh, the, the, <coughs> the various um, campaigns the the EACEA has run, but also the Erasmus Plus uh, program, absolutely useful. Whereas for the Erasmus Plus, we miss more initiatives that are usable for the uh, for the practitioners, for companies, for um, apprentices and for organizations supporting that, especially the training institutes. So the the program is is much more comfortable or easy applicable in universities, but uh, for the fragmented construction sectors with these very small companies, it is extremely difficult to deal with these programs written by academics and easier understandable for academics uh, than for uh, people from the shop floor. So um, that was the third slide. I think I, I reached my eight minutes. The last slide is just to show you what, what we did in the past. So one and a half years ago, we signed the Pact for Skills uh, the problem is uh, how how to bring how bringing together the the various uh, vertical uh, uh, yeah, vertical levels, uh, and and we try to have a more regular exchange with people from training institutes, from companies, workers' representatives, and those who are in the various areas involved in uh, vocational education. The construction blueprint project was a big project, uh, a Leonardo, uh, an Erasmus project over four years with more than 20 partners, extremely ambitious, extremely ambitious. And we, amongst others, worked out uh, curricula for the three main areas of activity. So and here again, we face uh, the same problem you have on the European level, financed partly by the EU. Uh, very ambitious and also interesting and uh, projects with very good results. But how to bring it to the addressee, how to make practice out of this uh, uh, project is is and remains uh, extremely difficult. So if you uh, look into this vet for leg brochure, you will see that uh, that I, I think it was a very also um, in a way, holistic approach. We have checked for eight countries how are the vocational education systems structured. Then we have had a look uh, on the technological changes. So talking about greening is good and saying that are the aim. It has to be like this. But what are the actual conditions in terms of technical possibilities? What are the changes, the, the material changes, and how can we improve on this basis and and not only from the um, more um, idealistic view how it should be and then a third level or a third part of this uh, uh, project was to to look into uh, actual practices and then a result is people from the one country can take uh, an experience from the other country but not one to one they pick out what fits to them and that is maybe uh, uh, one of, of the yeah, main conclusions from from our activities not giving up uh, to to improve and to go towards our general goals but seeing the uh, diversity in in the training systems in terms of history structure and also perspectives thank you 
Thanks, Rolf. Uh, those were very, very interesting insights. Thanks uh, for your honest views. I mean, I what I take out of uh, your intervention is the the, the challenges, uh, the complexity uh, of of the situation. We cannot be naive when addressing this these problems. Uh, it is also a challenge in terms of policy making and 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 bringing all 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 the circumstances uh, to the policy and also up, upscaling uh, certain projects. Uh, to the to the real uh, actors on 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 the ground. So ju just to follow up, I mean, I, I was going to uh, to ask you if if you had any specific examples uh, in, in your uh, experience on on how these these policies have really impacted on 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 the construction sector uh, on the ground, the EU policies on the renovation wave and and so on. Um, if you had any specific uh, uh, example to to highlight uh, on on the positive side. No, we have w lost Rolf. W w uh, it was towards me your question, but yes. I got lost indeed. I I didn't get your question. I was overwhelmed by my presentation and I left <laughs> unintendedly. <laughs> Sorry for no. that. No worries. I was no, asking, uh, see, if you have mm -hmm. any any positive example um, uh, on on how our EU policies uh, towards sustainability in the construction sector have impacted uh, on the ground. Um, honestly, I I cannot talk about the ground. Maybe uh, that that that's that's more for our colleague from FIEG. So they they are a bit closer. She comes from company level. We when we when we bring together people, we have contact with training institutes. We have contact uh, with our colleagues from the national federations, and uh, we we talk mainly about our experiences in the projects we we run. So we know that. Uh, uh, in in training institutes they they take care and we have also uh, some examples of using the EU projects for having an exchange of apprentices from one to another country that is something I think we we should uh, foster more but the, there is something but the, in terms of uh, um, the the impact of our activities here and the programs and and what we do with the pact for skills and so on is uh, uh, no i i it's cannot okay. Don't worry. We we will continue no. talking about this uh, during the session. Mm. So yeah. now it's it's Carmen De Vesa turn from my IITE, the Efficient Construction uh, oh, Association. Yeah. Yes, uh, that will talk about uh, their project, Habitable Project. So the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Anna. Thank you all on the alpha for the invitation. Um, well. Mm, yes, for tackling the subject, what are the current problems in the habitat sector uh, today? Mm, first of all, I would say that there is a mismatch of between working conditions in the in the companies of the sector and the expectations of a 21st century society, and probably this is the main cause, the main reason uh, for this labor shortage that companies are complaining about today. And let me give you just an idea, a figure. Uh, during the current academic year, 23-24, in our region, Castile and Leon, um, we have just 140 students, over 21,000 students who choose, uh, who have chosen um, subjects related to our sector, 140 uh, over 21,000 students. That's quite worrying. Um, secondly, um, there is also a gap between expectations of companies in terms of skills of workers and uh, skills, uh, real skills in students who come out of the of the of the schools of the bed centers so um what we find is that companies uh, doesn't uh, don't find what they need in 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 the students or in the in the in the in the workers and um 
uh, let, let me give you an idea. Uh, a Romstad study of this last year shows that in Spain, not in our region, in Spain, 72% of companies in the habitat sector cannot find suitable candidates for their vacancies. 72%, that's a lot in a country like Spain with more than 10% uh, of uh, unemployment. Next slide, please. Okay, so let me focus now in this term habitat instead of construction or building sector. Why do I say habitat in Castile and Leon? Well, because what we understand is that, is that habitat is a whole value chain uh, from local resources, natural resources like stone, um, like forestry, to uh, construction and demolition waste, upcycling wastes of the sector. And between those, uh, those terms, we have uh, architecture, engineering, construction, um, uh, uh, operation, um, secondary industry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is a strategic sector. It's not us who is saying it. It's our regional government of Castile and Leon who has said that the uh, habitat sector is a strategic one at the same level as automotive and agrofood industry. That's a lot in our region, believe me. So we are very proud of having this strategic plan approved by the regional government just one, one year and a half ago, more or less, in January 2022. Is the, is the only one in Spain and probably uh, the only one in, in Europe uh, uh, establishing uh, more than 70 goals with uh, 12 strategic lines or actions and then more than 100 um, actions in a second level, let's say, uh, with many stakeholders involved in the, in the plan from, uh, of course, policymakers, uh, public administrations, but also companies, also uh, civil society, students, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think if uh, one of the key points of this plan is the training system, and that's why we have the Education Council uh, of the region involved in the plan and in our habitable project. What is this? Next slide, please. Uh, what is this habitable um, uh, project? It's a Erasmus Plus uh, COVID project, and we are uh, trying to solve this this gap. On one hand, we have the demand from companies; they need uh, qualified workers, but qualified in new skills related to green transition, digital transition, and equality issues. Uh, very important in our in our sector because this is a very masculine sector, meaning uh, there are very few women, especially on site. Not only women. Uh, a, a colleague uh, said it before in the chat. We have many migrants in in the sector working in the sector. So we we need to uh, we have this all these needs of companies, and on the other hand, we have a training offer that is is slowly struggling to adapt to the characteristics of the new labor market, let's say. So this habitable project aims to be the solution of all this problem. And what we want to do is a platform, a place um, um, with, of course, in, uh, artificial intelligence to put all this together and to solve and um, uh, to break this gap, let's say. Next slide, please. How are we going to to solve this all these problems? It's a very ambitious uh, project. Well, we have um, we have this mu multi-platform solution uh, and habitable will address with this platform several facets, several points. Of course, we are creating a um, um, vet centers network, a collaborative network, of course. 
we are creating um, a tool for continuous monitoring of the needs of the sector because what we have now is a fixed picture, a static picture. But this this needs change every day, every day, and um, we uh, fortunately we have the companies with us. Aether as a cluster, we have more than 150 companies associated to to the cluster, so we can um, make this monitoring of the needs of the uh, sector continuously. So that will be very very useful. We have. Um, we plan to make an innovation hub between centers and companies because we need to work together, companies and, and vet centers. So this innovation hub will um, allow us to uh, propose uh, open innovation projects um, together with the centers, companies and centers. And of course, we plan a fourth point uh, training for the uh, teaching staff of all these um, centers of the network. And that's a very key point because as long as we have some centers, some vet centers in the consortium of the of the project, this is something they insist every time. It's not, it's not only uh, the students, it's the teachers. They need to be up, up to date. So they need to be teached also. They need to be trained also by the companies. Even the companies can provide teachers for these centers in a way. Next slide, please. Yes, um, just some figures. Um, we are uh, 90 partners from six countries, Spain, Portugal, Greece, uh, Aust uh, Austria, Moldova and Georgia. Um, very different countries, very different languages and cultures. A colleague in the chat said it before uh, regarding Armenia, I think. Uh, but we have the same problems and the same challenges, exactly the same. So uh, we, we are trying to solve uh, all, all this problem from, from the national experience of all of them, of all these, these partners. Next slide, please. Um, this project uh, began on June uh, of this year and it is uh, four years long. So we will and uh, we will finish by the end of May 27. Um, very intensive, especially this first year. We are working very hard, very, very hard. And um, we are learning a lot. And of course, in the last year, but there is also so much work in the middle. And that's all the planning you can uh, you can see in, in the screen. Um, that we are very, let's say, with a lot of implication of all the partners. Next slide, please. Is a five million euros uh, project um, with four million uh, euros uh, of grant of the European Union. We have 18 milestones and uh, uh, 19 deliverables and two reports, you know, reports, and nine international events. Next slide, please. Um, and with have 80% of prepayment, of course. It's quite an ambitious and challenging project, but I think that we are going as, as long as in the partnership, we have key, um, key stakeholders like the Council of Castilla Leon, the, the Education Council of Castilla and Leon. I think we are going to absolutely revolution the um, uh, training in the um, habitat sector. That's our ambition, and I'm sure we are going to get it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Carmen. That's uh, That was also a very inspiring uh, presentation. We are very proud of our uh, Centers of Vocational Excellence project, so I'm, I'm very glad to see uh, uh, the ambitions and uh, how you are 
uh, progressing. You mentioned very uh, interesting points. I mean, uh, this 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 very key figure that you shared on 141 students only in the construction sector in a big uh, region like uh, Castilla y León is, is, is really disappointing. And these expectation gaps uh, with what uh, the companies uh, want and what the system uh, provides. So what you are doing is, uh, is, is encouraging, but how, how, how to scale up all these uh, results of your project to the whole system? Uh, do you have any idea or, or plan? Well, yeah, um, I think I'm very proud of saying that Castilla and Leon is in the avant-garde of, of this transformation, even if we have just 140 uh, students in the region, uh, is the second biggest region uh, in, in Europe. Um, I think this, this multi-platform, this tool, all this uh, tool is going to be able to get our experience in Castilla and Leon Overall, with this uh, sectorial plan, strategic sectorial plan of, of the habitat sector to the rest of Europe, uh, because our regional government is very concerned and very involved in these goals. And I think the tool we are developing will be um, able to get this all, all this knowledge and experience to the rest of the regions of Europe. I think it, it's very powerful the, the, what we are doing. And indeed, uh, I think our network is going to be very, very strong because I must say that the uh, consortium, the partnership of the project is very, very powerful. And I think we are going to be able to disseminate and get our experience to the rest of 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 Europe and the regions of of Europe and um, I'm very expected hopefully yeah I'm very expectant with this yeah yeah perfect thanks a lot so now we will Thank turn you, to Angela uh, Martina from the European Construction Industry Federation who will present uh, their activities as regards the the, the renovation wave strategy and uh, reskilling uh, for apprentices in the construction sector so Angela the the floor is yours Good morning. Thank you. Good morning to everybody. Um, my name is Angela Martina. I'm the chairwoman of SOC 1 of FIEC, which is the working group on VET of FIEC. So I, I think that um, to start, I just give you some information about FIEC if you don't know it. And FIEC is the European Construction Industry Federation, and it gathers 32 national member federations from 27 countries. Um, it represents construction enterprises of all sizes from the small to medium ones to the big ones, which uh, are involved in building and civil engineering activities. And FIEC is officially recognized as an EU social partner representing employers of the construction industry. And in the framework of a social dialogue, FIEC together with EFBWW deals a lot and deeply about apprenticeship. And so this is just a short overview of what FIEC is, but uh, let's go on with apprenticeship. So uh, as you all know, and as it is, it was already said, the construction industry is facing a persistent and strong labor shortage. And so there is a strong need of workers. And if you have time, please, I invite you to get a look to the FIEC position paper which was published uh, last October, and which can give you some data about the shortage of labor of workers in um, state members. And it, I think it's very interesting. So uh, it, there is a need for workers, but there is a need of, for skilled workers. And this is because um, construction industry has been changing and also because European and national policies are giving new environmental goals. And uh, estimations indicate that the green transition could lead to the creation of between 
1 million to 2.5 million additional jobs. Stellina talked about 7 million jobs. Yes, because this is just an estimate. My was, uh, mine is just an estimate that regards green transition. And then we, we have also the replacement of workers which retire. So 7 million is, a, I think, is an um, estimate that um, gets along with mine. Uh, um, but which are the causes of labor shortage? Um, we already spoke about about it, and but it is it, it is due to democratic demographic changes, of course. There is a low attractiveness of the sector, and then there is also the need of new skills. An apprenticeship can be a tool to attract young workers and promote the sector. Um, in the next slide, uh, we can also see that uh, investment in construction are um, growing and the renovation wave would result in 35 million buildings being renovated by 2030. So there is uh, one more reason that makes us understand that we need skilled workers. And also that uh, apprenticeship can um, support EU in reskilling and upskilling. And so then um, after I will show you some examples of apprenticeship in Italy, but you will see that this apprenticeship is just for young people. Maybe we have to think about adult apprenticeship too. And so in next slide, please, we have examples from Italy. I, I give you some um, an idea of what is going on in Italy. In Italy, they, uh, we have three types of apprenticeship. Uh, the first type is apprenticeship for the acquisition of an upper secondary vocational qualification. The uh, apprentices are people between 15 to 25 years old. This is the kind of apprenticeship that is um, um, run in vet schools. And here the students make, uh, can make some experience also on the job. Then there is the second kind of um, uh, apprenticeship, which is very used in Italy. And we call it professionalizing apprenticeship. And it is, um, there are contracts that company make and to teach a profession. And the um, apprentices are from 18 to 29 years old. And then the third type of apprenticeship is about higher education and research. And it, this is for university students, also from 18 to 29 years old. And now I, will, mm, I would like to give you some uh, numbers about apprentices. In Italy, uh, the 17th percent of uh, workers are apprentices. So it is a huge um, amount of people. And in the next slide, I, I show you um, the difference between the composition of the apprenticeship. Um, please, let's get a look to the second part of the table, which is about year 2020. Now, um, previous slide, please. Okay, here. And the second part of the table is about here, is more recent, is 2020. And in the first column, where you can read primo livello, is the first kind of apprenticeship. And the second column in the second kind of apprenticeship. And the third is the third type of apprenticeship. Let's get a look to the last row, which is the total number. And as you can see, the first level is 10, counts 10,000 people. The second level, 500,000. And the third type is just 1,000. This is what I previously said, the second kind of apprenticeship, that is the kind of contract that companies can use to hire young people is very, very used. It's almost the 98% of all apprenticeships. In the next slide, uh, we can see what it is in construction, and the um, proportion is very similar. 95.5% of apprenticeship is about the second 
type. Uh, in the, then I give you some more information in the next slide. Uh, which, okay, a lot of numbers here, but um, here we can um, understand um, how many uh, after apprenticeship, after apprenticeship, how and uh, what happens. Uh, it's almost the 17% of contracts, apprenticeship contracts, become an long, a long term contract. Uh, which the numbers is in the uh, you have a lot of numbers, but more or less is, this is the the real percentage. In the next uh, uh, slide, I just summarize a, an example of good practice. Okay, so as you said, as I told you, the second type of apprenticeship is the more used, but I would like to give you an idea of good practice that regards the first type of apprenticeship. Um, in our vet schools, the programs are three-year programs. But in some of our schools in particular, I know very well the school in Udine. Uh, um, the fourth year is introduced, as being introduced, and the fourth year of vet school is used to um, for apprenticeship. This means that uh, the students go on the job, they strain in practice what they learned theor theoretically, and after this fourth year, they get a qualification as construction technicians. I uh, think that is a good idea because um, it gives a, a better um, idea of the sector, it improves the, um, the image of the sector, and also it, uh, the, our students can get a qualification that usually they don't have. Um, in the last slide, I just summarized the ch challenges faced by the industry in apprenticeship. Uh, the image of the sector needs to be improved. We, often say that, and also the image of apprenticeship, that there is a problem in birth rate. I don't know what we can do about it, but we have to think about it. And then there is, um, it must be improved also the mobility of apprenticeships to give, to improve their skills. And another thing I already said, it's not written here, but maybe we have to think about apprentices, apprenticeship for adults too. And that's it. And so I, I hope I stayed in my eight minutes. <laughs> I was thank a bit you. in a rush. <laughs> so thank, thank you, you Angela. Yes, indeed. I mean, this, this last comment that you made on adult apprenticeships is something that we also uh, have been discussing lately. We did in the high level event organized by, by Affine in June, and it emerges as, a, as an interesting pathway uh, to promote also as part of the European Year of Skills. But um, uh, after your presentation, I would be also interested in knowing from your side uh, if if you think any of uh, EU initiative that uh, has an impact uh, in, in your sector or uh, how social dialogue is also a, a key driver to, to, to make this green transformation happen? Um, I, I can just say that uh, everything we discuss in the social dialogue is always very important. And sometimes we are not very good, I, I, I speak for myself, not very good in um, speak about it to the um, nation and then to the region and then to our cities, no? to or our vet school. Sometimes we try to do it, but we, we are not very good in mixing it together. But and, uh, all the discussion we have is then is reported. It should be reported more and more deeply, but it is reported on local site. And then what, um, and, and then the, a goal of vet schools is quite often that of spread this information also to the companies and to the workers. And we have to do a better job in this, in this linking, in this matching. And But I, I have seen that in the last years, all the information, a bit slowly maybe, but it's coming also to the companies through this way, through our vet schools. Yeah. 
good good to know that uh, the challenge is acknowledged and that there are measures taken to to address this so now it's we are moving to to marcel um it he is the project manager uh, at the institute for training in construction sector in luxembourg and he will be sharing uh, some uh, practices from the project funded by the european social fund uh, for young construction workers so marcel the floor is yours thanks a lot yeah i will give you some uh, information about uh, or company first to, to know what uh, we are doing. Uh, IFSB is a training uh, institute, but uh, we are private one. Uh, we belong to the construction sector, uh, especially for the uh, structural work and uh, engaged by two um, federation who are the owner of the, the, the training uh, uh, company uh, IFSB. Then that's why we are uh, directly impacted by what they need and what we can uh, give uh, for, for them. And we try to answer exactly uh, to all the, the questions coming from the companies. We are then, um, we have uh, only uh, private uh, uh, finance and uh, also, uh, hopefully, uh, financing from uh, Europe to help us to, to make our uh, training session. We are in an ecosystem, we can say, because we have also uh, created sister company who are uh, making uh, advisory for uh, in, um, some information for the uh, new uh, needed uh, information from the construction. Um, for example, for the um, for the energy, for energy, yeah. <laughs> we are also engaged for innovation because uh, construction is uh, really uh, impacted by uh, a lot of new things we have to uh, improve in our work. Uh, next slide, please. Then. Not only because of the uh, European Green Deal, but uh, for a lot of things we are doing then continuing training. Uh, and for the moment, we are engaged with eco-secular construction for, uh, for example, drinking water management or surely uh, for sustainable renovation. It's uh, very important at the moment. That's why we have also an indirect uh, project uh, named E equals zero. But we are also engaged in initial training in some uh, schools or university here in Luxembourg and in the great region uh, to help them because we have uh, some knowledge, but also some places to have uh, uh, real exercises to do and uh, the trainees like to have uh, real work to do. Then uh, we have some person coming from university to have uh, some uh, information about sustainable construction, but also, for example, for concrete. And at this moment, we are uh, surely uh, engaged in uh, low carbon uh, countries uh, because it's a, a very important question at the moment. We use some uh, new uh, system of education, but uh, with e-learning, virtual immersion, but uh, we are always uh, mixing it with uh, concrete work in our company. Uh, that's why with uh, our company, we try to promote uh, the, the construction sector to develop uh, some courses from for the, the the workers and to help them to evaluate in their uh, careers. We try to uh, give the opportunity to young people to discover the construction sector. It's very hard to do. <laughs> There's not a lot of uh, young people who wanted to enter in this type of uh, job, uh, but we are doing this job uh, anyway. 
and we are also working with uh, the office uh, for the unemployed uh, people here in Luxembourg named ADEM uh, to uh, give the opportunity to this person to have the possibility to enter in some work that is basic works for them in the construction sector and they find quite directly uh, a place in the companies here in uh, in Luxembourg. Uh, the next one, please. Um, for the moment, uh, we are engaged in the uh, problem of the uh, carbon footprint of the sector. And there is a lot of uh, new uh, training session with based of the, on this uh, problem. And in the same time, in the eco-secular uh, construction, um, this is uh, a need that's come from uh, some regularly from uh, Europe, but also the needs of uh, the companies here in uh, in Luxembourg. We know that um, the, the the workers on site is um, uh, it's a very hard job with uh, the uh, condition, atmospheric condi conditions, not really easy. And uh, we have to talk about new system to uh, have construction with uh, uh, more easy to do, and uh, perhaps with uh, possibility to have uh, uh, factory prefabrication, uh, something like this. And that's why we are uh, trying, making training in the, this uh, way to uh, inform the companies and to give them the opportunity to, I can say, transform the uh, way of uh, doing their job. Um, it's also important to have a CSR. Uh, it's not, uh, for the moment, the, the, the young people are really uh, sensibilized by this, and uh, it's a possibility to give them the, the, the opportunity to come to our sector uh, to say, well, it's important also for the sector to, to be uh, uh, very engaged in this way. Um, the next one. For Example, um, well, with the Green Deal, uh, the European one, uh, we know that we have to uh, lower carbon effect uh, for the next year, uh, 2030. 55% is quite a, a lot. And if we want to have 100% in uh, 2050, we have a lot to do. Then uh, there is training for the workers, surely, and also for the managers, but also for the engineers, the architects, uh, for the uh, older people working in this uh, sector. And uh, we are proposing this type of training session. And for the manager, uh, we have apprenticeship we are making in our institute is uh, during uh, one year. Um, to to give them uh, the all uh, information they need to to have the the new possibility the the new buildings uh, for 20 30 uh, years. Um, then we uh, we can say that uh, the innovation it's uh, always uh, uh, a challenge for us because we have to use new projects, we have to uh, have new uh, possibilities, for example, for the facade uh, with novel uh, function, to have uh, PV, to have green facade, uh, to have uh, uh, facade producing uh, some energy. Um, all of this uh, is new for, for the the workers and for the managers in the construction sector. And uh, all of this is, uh, if it's new, we have to, to have uh, some training session in this uh, special uh, target field 
uh, uh, here in uh, in Luxembourg. I think it's the same in all in all the countries, huh? but uh, especially in our country, uh, we have uh, quite expensive houses, and uh, the, the 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 owners want to have the the most efficient uh, construction, and uh, then they 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 are engaged to have some innovation in their construction in their houses. And uh, well, we have to respond to the uh, attend to the demand of these uh, uh, builders here in uh, in Luxembourg. The next one, please. Yeah, that's all what we have. Oh, uh, it's uh, one example. Uh, it's a, a new uh, training uh, session we have created this year. It's a low carbon advisor and uh, it's uh, basic courses during 40 hours uh, for then the, the managers, for the architects, for the uh, engineers uh, to uh, give them all the information needed for the uh, low carbon footprint, uh, but also uh, the new regulation in Europe, but also in uh, Luxembourg, and how to do their best in this uh, uh, new challenge uh, for, the, the, for the years coming. We have also 80 hours more for some modules about energy, water, the, the air quality, uh, the vegetalization is quite important also in the uh, construction sector uh, with the uh, urban farming, for example. Um, we have, for example, uh, created here with an uh, indirect project also a greenhouse or on our building, and it's a project named Groove uh, to um, try to. Uh, sensibilize they, the, the person about the, the possibility to come with the nature inside the city to uh, and in the same time to reuse the air coming from the uh, building inside the greenhouse and then to uh, uh, have less CO2, CO2 uh, inside the air green with the the seeds uh, that we have in the in the greenhouse. It's a, it's quite a, a small example, um, but it's also what we are doing here in the IFSB. Um, we are engaged uh, with the uh, problem with carbon, sure, uh, and also with uh, new projects like uh, use, uh, utilization of uh, Biochar uh, in the concrete, uh, for example, to try to capture, to stock the, the CO2 and to have uh, less uh, cement, for example, uh, for, for the, the construction. Um, I will say that the, the construction sector is uh, in the same like in Europe, in our country, we, we are a uh, uh, lack of, uh, of uh, workers. We need more and more workers, but surely uh, with the new qualification, with uh, a lot of uh, knowledge about all of this. And this knowledge is not coming from the, the school. Uh, and a little bit from the university, but it's not enough. Then we, we need country continuous uh, training to be sure that we can give all the information. Many but thanks, Marcel. Many thanks. <laughs> yes, yeah. I think we are running out of time. So um, now it's it's the time really for the question and answers. Uh, so I don't know. I don't see any more question and answers uh, in the chat. But maybe uh, fellow uh, speakers have uh, some some questions. Uh, 
for your uh, for the other speakers, uh, because otherwise I would just ask you um, all a, a bit more of a general question on on apprenticeships. Huh? So um, how how uh, which are the most common challenges for apprenticeships in in the construction sector and what can they bring compared to other uh, learning uh, pathways? And who, whoever wants to take the floor, please please go ahead. Uh, Rolf. Yeah, uh, in a nutshell, I think uh, the challenge is uh, again uh, that we have this high complexity and we have small companies, so you need more generalists and that is what we can see. Uh, I was hesitating to talk about uh, uh, examples, but we have of course a lot. The build up skills uh, uh, programs over years that they had their impact in terms of courses. Fine. We have a lot of other things in Poland, in Hungary, in Bel Belgium, based on EU projects. They they gained experience and and ideas to change their curricula, and that is that is my point. The the apprenticeship in the construction sectors needs to be a broad one. You have one person that should be able to plan the work, to have communication with the client to carry out the work, to choose the material, to make the quality uh, a check uh, and also the maintenance work in an ideal word, world. Uh, but you need more generalists, that, that is important. And what we can see, uh, Angela will, will support that or, or confirm that uh, we were with our social dialogue in Hungary and they were uh, reframing their curricula and it is was also the basic idea to uh, to have relatively broad professions uh, which can also transfer their knowledge when changing the company. That is my last sentence. Because of the higher uh, uh, differentiation of knowledge and complexity, uh, the, the, what a company needs is more specific. And that is important for the company, but the worker needs to be more generalized also to switch from one to another company that remains uh, uh, let's say a reality. These switches. Thank you, so, Rolf. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your words, uh, Carmen. Well, uh, I totally agree with Rolf. Of course, uh, for me, one of the main challenges uh, or the main uh, well things to do is to recognize officially the micro credentials. We are foreseeing this in all the um, European projects, in all the COVID projects, and uh, but what is essential is to to have these micro credentials officially for the whole European Union, for a Polish worker to come to Spain with these micro credentials, even even inside the countries between regions. It's not easy to. Uh, we need the central government to recognize these micro credentials, and that's, that that is going to be a very useful tool in terms of, of answering the needs of the companies with their apprentices apprenticeship. Thank you, Carmen. We we are working on promoting micro credentials as a very powerful tool for flexible and targeted training uh, for adults. Uh, so uh, we are on it together. Angela. Oh, sorry. Okay, you can hear me, right? Okay. Um, the main challenge for me is not just for apprenticeship, but also for all the sector that is improving the image of the sector. Because um, as Carmen said um, in her presentation, that there is a mismatch between working conditions and expectations. But we have to go on saying that the working conditions can be always improved, but now they are much better than they used to be. And the sector has great potentiality and great goals to be achieved. And so it's a good sector in which you can work. Thank you, Angela. I think we ought to acknowledge that, that challenge and we should reflect on, on how to uh, improve this, this image uh, together. Um, I see Marcel also has a last word, but very quickly because I need to close. Thanks. Yeah. Just one word. The, the the main problem is not to have a apprenticeship, but to have uh, some people to to 
train because uh, there is not a lot of person wanting to come to the construction sector. That is the first one, uh, thing we have to do is to have some attraction to the construction sector. Indeed, you are completely right. This was raised uh, during the sessions today. So at this stage, I, I will need to thank you very much, uh, uh, our experts and panelists, for uh, the insightful contribution to the event. I really hope that uh, it inspired uh, many of our participants. I think that the presentations were excellent, uh, very different approaches, very interesting insights. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that um, uh, this will be food for thought and that we will surely uh, take this conversation forward uh, at another um, uh, moment. So special thanks also to our EAFA members who are present today and who have already committed uh, in taking uh, a pledge. We also invite the non-members to join our alliance. And, um, and work together for more and, and better apprenticeships. I think our colleagues uh, are posting some links in our chat uh, for the EAFA registration page and also to our LinkedIn group uh, in case that's interesting for you to follow our activities. So finally, uh, I would just like to thank our audience for uh, their engagement and their interest and uh, looking forward to welcoming you again in our next EAFA webinar on apprentice uh, mobility that it's uh, tentatively scheduled for the 14th of December. So thank you everybody and see you next time. Bye bye. Thank you. Anna. Thank you. Bye.